This actually feeds, it, it's outside of uh, California, but it actually feeds currently about one gigawatt of baseload power into the uh, Californian grid. So what's the exchange rate uh, from uh, coal fire or gas fire to nice clean uh, solar energy? Here is Solar Star. This is the most productive uh, solar PV farm in California. Its uh, capacity is nearly 580 megawatts. But when you average that over a year, that's only 175. And in particular, if you look at the months of January and December, the average power output is only 100 megawatts. Now, we're all aware of the intermittency issues. So, again, if we just look at uh, December, January, there happens to be a, a 100 megawatt uh, battery just installed uh, in Australia. And this is courtesy of Elon Musk and his Tesla company. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you may think, uh, problem solved. Um, but this could only, even if you could use the full capacity, it would only supply 100 megawatt of power for a little over an hour and a quarter. So to match base load one gigawatt power, you'd actually need 10 solar stars, uh, 32,000 acres or 13,000 hectares. And you'd need to match that with 160 Tesla batteries. And if you look at the cost, today's dollars price, uh, we're looking at $13 billion. And this is optimistic. It's probably more than that. So, you know, this is where we are with terrestrial uh, PV right, right now, if you look at the baseload power capability. Now, you could compare that with a, a similar antenna. Uh, we still need a, a little storage, as uh, John spoke about yesterday, to do with uh, up to 70-minute outages. Uh, but we're only down uh, 2,000 hectares, 5,000 <laughs> acres. So, towards baseload power, there's, uh, you may recognize uh, these uh, two designs. Uh, so, very uh, clever and intricate designs which overcome the rotational mismatch uh, between the sun pointing and the earth pointing parts. Uh, there's other, perhaps simpler designs, perhaps uh, more realizable in the short term, which are solid state in, in nature. But one issue is that uh, these always stay uh, either earth pointing or try and stay sun pointing. But in either case, you're going to get cosine losses as you twist away uh, from the sun, as you inevitably must do. So typically, these can only supply, on average, between 8 or 16 uh, hours of power per day. Now, there are solid state designs, or at least one I'm aware of, uh, which is both solid state and able to, to deliver base load power. But it does that at a huge cost. The only one third of this massive PV array is uh, available for use at any time, and probably less than that. So in contrast, Cassiopeia, it overcomes the rotational mismatch, rather than having a clever mechanical design, by having a, a, a novel phased array design, which allows the power beam to be rotated around through a full 360 degrees azimuth. So this makes the or design, perhaps no less, no more complicated than other similar uh, solid state designs, but this can deliver base load power 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year, uh, excepting the, uh, the spring and autumn equinox periods. So, if you go back to uh, the phase arrays we use now, there's a, a series of very logical steps you can take and decisions you take along the way, which lead to a very sensible and logical design. But there's a saying that if you continue to do things the same way, you'll end up with the same result. So I've taken a slightly different approach. I've actually started at uh, the very uh, bottom uh, of the design, looking at uh, individual RF elements and seeing what would it, be, what would it take to enable uh, steering through 360 degrees. So the, the next step is then to verify the, the result independently to make sure that it's not just me dreaming and having made a, a mistake on this. Uh, but then we start to reap some advantages that we have one structure where not only do we have the RF phased array, but we can also, uh, similar to sandwich panel designs, we can integrate with other SPS functions such as concentrated PV. And particularly if we 
look at an always sun pointing design that allows the very highest efficiencies and also the maximizers on the, the use of uh, scarce elemental resources such as indium and, and gallium. So, starting step one. Uh, this is a, a simple half-wave uh, dipole. Uh, that's perhaps unusual for a phased array design. Everything seems to be patch antennas. Uh, does anyone still have a, a phone with a sticking out an antenna? Probably in a drawer somewhere. Uh, anyone still use it in the past few decades? I have a little cassette tape too. <laughs> um, it's an omnidirectional field pattern, but no steering capability by itself. However, if you have three dipoles or other similar omnidirectional antenna, you can set up a field pattern which is electronically steerable. And this replaces the, the rear reflector which you would need in a traditional patch antenna or other elements used in a planar phased array. So, next step was uh, validating the results. So, first thing is to go back to uh, a standard textbook planar phased array and uh, check that whatever we're simulating, we get the expected result. And this is the expected result if you lack uh, the rear reflector, you end up with two primary lobes uh, as a mirror image of each other. So typically you wouldn't have this, you would have this physical reflector and have double the power sent in one direction. And you would also limit the steering to around about plus or minus 45 degrees uh, because the, the beam is pretty well unusable when you're along uh, the end fire mode at, at uh, plus or minus 90 degrees. In contrast, this is the uh, same result for a, an equivalent phased array, same number of elements, similar format, but twisted into a helix. And you can see it's a, a much cleaner uh, a primary lobe. And the, the tiny uh, rear field we, we can see here is actually 40,000 times, sorry, 10,000 uh, 10, times uh, smaller than the primary lobe. And that's just with 56 by 88 elements. So that would actually improve further with more elements. And here's the two side by side. Now I must point out, I've got a slight ellipse here, and I think that's a slight modeling area, error where we should be losing a few dB uh, in the uh, end fire mode. Uh, but this is correct for Cassiopeia, where there's no dB loss when you're steering through azimuth. And this is the intensity pattern that you would expect to see at the rectenna as the satellite appears to rotate uh, once per day. The satellite's actually rotating only once per year as it remains always sun-facing as Earth travels through its orbit. Uh, of note here is that we're aiming for a peak intensity. Now, I've used the figure 230 watts per square meter. It's uh, a figure which has been adopted uh, by NASA and uh, some other concepts as a safe uh, level of microwave intensity, uh, safe for wildlife, for example, to, to fly through. Uh, all the examples I'll show later on use this same figure as an optimum. If you exceed 230, then you start to get into what may be considered as unsafe levels of microwave intensity. And if you go below that figure, then that means that you'll need a larger rectenna to capture the same amount of the field, and perhaps it won't be working as efficiently. So this is a, a patented design, and this uh, shows an arrangement of triple dipole elements arranged in a helical format. Now this doesn't have the, the PV uh, shown, but this does. This was the original concept, uh, which used a, a side illumination, and the solar aperture matched the RF aperture. Um, which um, w was fine, but I did uh, discover uh, late last year that in order to have even RF illumination, there's a need to uh, distribute power from the middle layers out to the extreme north-south layers. Uh, certainly achievable, I looked at a one kilovolt bus and at 95% power distribution efficiency, that was adding about 15% extra mass to the whole satellite, uh, just as copper bus bar. More recently, here's an example uh, where we, we keep the same uh, Fresnel concentrators and the secondary uh, curler uh, optical element. 
Uh, but rearrange it so that the illumination is from solar north and solar south. So not shown here is the reflectors required to do that. And this rotation is purely to show you the design. It, it doesn't reflect how the, the satellite actually rotates uh, on orbit. And uh, you can see that this is two quadrants on either side. So the total illumination of the whole satellite is, in this case, one sun. But unlike uh, a sandwich panel design now, we can use both sides. So we can actually have two sun illumination of the whole structure. This was uh, another example where I looked at the possibility of using standard PV rather than high concentration concentrated CPV. And uh, I did find that uh, with radiation protection cover glass of 100 micron thickness, this added a significant weight penalty. We went from being around about 50% of the SPS mass to over 75% of the SPS mass just in PV alone. But uh, one thing I should point out here, that all the PV is being used. There, there is no redundant PV in this example for a solid state uh, satellite. So here's uh, three concepts going from 1 gigawatt through 1.4 to 1.9 gigawatt. So here we have the quadrant uh, 45 degree reflectors as shown. Again, this is just to illustrate the, the design. Uh, this is the actual rotation once, once per year. And we can quite easily, with no added complication, replace these quadrant reflectors with full elliptical reflectors at 45 degrees, giving a total of two sun illumination. And uh, we don't uh, increase the, the mass by 40% when we do it. We actually get a, a gain uh, by doing that. And we can actually go up to four sun illumination, uh, keeping the, thermal, uh, the, the temperature within the thermal limits of the CPV. And this is done uh, with uh, solid state uh, reflectors. And a fairly complex uh, arrangement there. They're not quite uh, parabolic. And that's to ensure that we have a concentrated but collimated beam coming from solar north-south. Uh, there's been some improvements which, uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, talk about uh, at this time. And before I move on, these previous examples were all for a geostationary orbit. But we can actually achieve near base load power levels from much closer in orbits. And this is an example of a three-hour sun-synchronous orbit. So yes, the, the satellites appear to move uh, in the reverse direction to, to convention to maintain the, the plane with respect to the sun direction. Now, it's a little hard to follow on here. But if you just follow the red satellite, you can see even as it goes through Earth's shadow over here, you never lose you never enter Earth's eclipse. So the, one of these five satellites in the constellation can always uh, beam power to somewhere on the Earth. And this over here shows that uh, with an international collaboration, we could actually beam power to uh, three rectenna sites on the Earth using five satellites and achieve simultaneous near base load levels. So there we can see nearly 98% for for Japan, that this was originally shown in, in Japan. Uh, Chicago, uh, nearly 90%. And the example here is Moscow at uh, nearly 71%. And that's simultaneous. So you're getting a very high rectenna utilization and around about 50% satellite utilization. And by going a little further out uh, to a medium Earth orbit, a 12 hour orbit, um, or any orbit between the two Van Allen belts, uh, not animated this, but uh, here we have four satellites, taking advantage of the wide beam steering capability. So the rectenna would have to work down to a fairly low elevation. But again, uh, near base load levels of power to four rectenna sites around the world. And the same utilization of the satellites. So now I'd like to move on to the materials and the technology used. And, uh, the key point I want to get across is that I've only considered very high technology readiness levels or commercially available parts with a, a previous space precedent. So here I've shown the, the Icaros uh, satellite produced by the uh, solar sailing satellite, a Japanese uh, example. Um, attitude control, where we can use the limitless propellant of photon pressure. And uh, if we have 
an area of extra reflector forward of the center of mass, we actually achieve a passively stable uh, attitude control, similar to gravity gradient stabilization. By overlaying this with electrochromic uh, panels, then we can have active control to dampen out any oscillation. Here's the, the reflectors themselves. Uh, again, Icarus is one example of metallized polyimide. Uh, I believe Icarus used uh, aluminium as, as the uh, metallization. Uh, here, I believe we need to use uh, silver uh, because this is sh showing the spectrum of the triple junction CPV I've used as an example. And you'd actually get quite a loss using aluminium where you're getting around 97% uh, uh, reflectance uh, from uh, using silver across the band we're interested in. It does cut down on some of the harder UV, which uh, no longer reaches uh, the CPV. Uh, again, precedent. Here's a, I can, I can see Paul nodding his head. There's a stretched Lansdor array, uh, which used a similar high concentration uh, Fresnel concentrators and secondary dome optic, I believe. And this is the actual configuration I'd like to use, which is based on experimental uh, testing by a company called LPI, uh, which gives very good results, uh, very high uh, gain acceptance angle product. Uh, this is actually a COTS uh, CPB cell uh, by the company uh, Azure Space. They do sell non-concentrated versions which are space rated. I've also used data from Spectralab. And as for the actual circuitry on here, uh, this is uh, industry standard uh, flex circuitry. Precedence there, would, for example, would be the Curiosity uh, rover on Mars. Um, we need to be able to launch this. Again, I wanted to use today's technology. So here's the, uh, uh, the Falcon 9 or the Falcon Heavy uh, payload shroud. Uh, I should point out that don't believe all the hype about it being able to lift nearly 64 tons to low Earth orbit. Its actual hard limit is around 10.8 tons. And the complication is that whatever payload mass you're taking, for example, eight tons reusable for, for the boosters, the center of mass has to be concentrated around about uh, the first 440 millimeters of this 11 meter tall payload shroud, which is a little bit of a complication. Here's uh, two examples of typical payloads to launch the Cassiopeia array uh, along uh, a geo geosynchronous uh, transfer orbit, which then translates uh, to a, a geosynchronous uh, circular orbit. And we don't want to, I'm moving a bit ahead of myself there. Uh, so this is an example of uh, rendezvous along the transfer orbit before one of these orbital maneuvering systems then does the uh, uh, plane change and circularization maneuver to bring it into the geosynchronous orbit. And I've actually chosen a uh, Laplace plane orbit optimized for the very high area to mass of the Cassiopeia array. So this is a very stable so-called frozen orbit. And we don't want to throw away any of the mass. So these, this uh, composite frame structure was used to control the multiple layers uh, lifted as a payload and then forms part of the, the backbone structure of the Cassiopeia array. So again, here's the uh, three examples. And you might say, well, obviously the 1.9 gigawatt version appears to have a far higher specific mass. So why not just concentrate on this specific design? But if you remember earlier, I was talking about the optimum intensity as received at the rectenna. So for any given orbital altitude or beaming distance and power level and wavelength, uh, there is an optimum design which uh, as shown here. Uh, these are the uh, charts which are uh, used for direct comparison. Uh, key point is that there's three configurations that's optimized and the cost figures I've put down here are a path direct to a one gigawatt geosynchronous uh, design and these are using today's launch prices uh, not uh, based on future reductions in launch cost. Uh, it's a geosynchronous Laplace plane, as I mentioned, and I've already talked about the specific inclination, giving you about uh, eight degrees from the equatorial. 
Uh, also considered 5.8 uh, gigahertz, but 2.45 gigahertz is more mature. You get higher efficiencies. And uh, some of these are put down to be, the, uh, to be determined uh, because the intensity pattern isn't quite Gaussian uh, nor airy. So it needs a little bit uh, more analysis just to figure out what the, the averages would be. Uh, so plenty of benefits, but the, the key benefits are the fact that it's solid state, uh, simpler uh, construction than um, one with articulated joints. Uh, it's always sun pointing, so you've got the ability to use the highest efficiency in photovoltaics, and it's a very low mass design. And challenges, plentiful engineering challenges. Uh, we've got spectrum challenges, as mentioned uh, yesterday. Um, the biggest challenge is perhaps finding the political and societal will to actually take the first step and get something of beaming power from space. Next steps, uh, in this case, the logical next step would be to move forward with the RF ASIC uh, design to enable meter scale or slightly bigger uh, ground-based uh, demonstrations and then followed perhaps by balloon-borne uh, demonstrations. I'm sorry, but I, I have to just say as the chair of the symposium, your time was over 15 minutes ago. Uh, oh, <laughs> you missed it at the beginning, right? Because I we guess I did because you started on time and I said, don't start on time, wait um, a couple minutes, but that's okay. Sorry. Okay, I'm nevertheless, very nervous. nevertheless, it's now almost 2.30. So, yeah, we're, we're going to do the questions in the, the, the panel. So, but yeah, please. Yeah, it's right at, at the end. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, I, I, I apologize. Okay. <laughs> Technology readiness, already spoken about this. Uh, roadmap. Um, so, if I'd shown us starting in the stratosphere, that would just be a dot on the axes. But uh, I did show the example of a three-hour sun-synchronous elliptical orbit, uh, medium Earth orbit, before we progress to a gigawatt scale uh, satellites. And here's a very short uh, video. I, I let's, let's do this. Okay, the, we'll, the we'll skip the, the video. Um, main summary on um, using a stratospheric uh, a demonstrator is that it's not in space and uh, most would perhaps prefer to uh, beam power from low earth orbit but uh, I don't think you'll get a meaningful demonstration of space-based solar power <laughs> from low earth orbit. Okay, thank you very much. Alright, our next speaker is from the California Institute of Technology, Michael Kelsenberg, who has been privileged to work on one of the uh, space solar concepts that's gotten a lot of attention in recent years, the uh, Space Solar Power Initiative, which is a joint venture between Caltech and Northrop Grumman. Please welcome Michael. Thank you, Paul. And Thank you everyone for your attention today. It is an honor to be here presenting at this event in front of so many experts and leaders in the field of space-based solar power. So thank you to the organizers uh, for having us. Um, and thank you for not being intimidating like a, like a mafia or anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm relatively new to this field and I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying uh, working in this. <laughs> all right, all right, moving forward. Um, so um, I'm here to talk about the uh, Caltech SSPI Space Solar Power Initiative slash Space Solar Power Project, um, which is, I think, in, in comparison to most of the other presentations you'll see this afternoon, is a project focused a little bit more on technology development than on a specific um, manifestation of space-based solar power, although our work is certainly motivated by an overall vision uh, for ways to make space-based solar power a reality. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of the technologies in uh, very briefly and point out that this, uh, increasingly this is being published um, and where possible I'll have references uh, where you can look at more information. So our goal is to uh, develop technologies that will enable cost-effective space-based solar power um, as well as technologies that I think will enable other ambitions in space um, which are being discussed a lot at this conference. Um, and which I personally find to be very motivating. 
Um, the project started um, formally at, uh, around the beginning of 2015, maybe late 2014, is a space solar power initiative. Um, this was funded by Northrop Grumman um, and being done primarily at Caltech with support from Northrop Grumman. Um, what was proposed was a space-based solar power satellite comprising free-flying spacecraft um, targeting very high specific power as one of the key areas of technology development, um, which uh, going along with that, a very low aerial mass, um, and development of, of new approaches to making lightweight deployable spacecraft um, and very thin films. So to look at the system breakdown, um, we, we would have a large system um, which is comprised of free-flying modules, uh, which can be launched separately and swapped in and out, for example, uh, during the mission lifetime. Uh, the module is, is comprised of these truss elements made from strips, and then eventually the building block is something that we call the tile, um, which is, is um, similar in function to the sandwich module or, or, or any other way that you might hear it referred. But basically that is an autonomously functioning, largely, uh, converter from sunlight to RF energy. And some nominal values for this could be that um, you'd have on the order of gigawatts at the system level, um, and each individual tile is uh, at the, sort of the 10 centimeter level and is responsible for delivering uh, on the order of a watt to the grid. Um, looking a little bit at the, at the module design, this would be a self-deploying spacecraft um, that uses lightweight structures and uh, collapsible booms to deploy a rectangular or a square um, sail, you know, sunlight converter area over a large area, and at the center is a hub which has the actual spacecraft control um, and communication electronics. So I, um, to try and keep the talk on track, I took an already time-lapse video and sped it up even more. Um, so that's a very quick uh, lab-scale concept deployment video for a meter-scale um, prototype. Uh, but the, uh, the core concept here is to have a high packing efficiency by using this uh, origami folding and rolling um, deployment mechanism. Another issue for free-flying spacecraft, of course, is uh, how do you keep them pointed in the right direction and in the right formation. This is a big challenge for the free-flying spacecraft approach and is one that has been subject to some optimization, um, which is shown uh, in more detail in the paper that's shown here at the bottom of the screen, but to summarize it, um, some researchers ran optimization of, uh, and this is a geostationary orbit, um, optimization of different uh, <coughs> schemes of using uh, propellant. This would assume a high ISP, um, so electric propulsion uh, scheme to keep the individual spacecraft um, assembled in the correct pattern. And there are, of course, um, grading load losses associated with having gaps between the spacecraft. Um, that is taken into account in the optimization, um, at least from a power delivery standpoint. What is not taken into account, I can tell you, is where that extra energy goes, um, which is now, uh, as a result of a talk yesterday, a little bit more prominent on our, our minds, I think. Um, but certainly from an energy delivery, um, so, or as it would pertain to calculating an LCOE for the project, that is taken into account. And the result is that a, a propellant mass for like a 10-year mission lifespan at geostationary orbit for the case considered, um, that propellant mass is actually reasonable and a small fraction of the overall spacecraft mass. Another unique aspect, I think, of, of this particular project um, is the decision to go to CMOS uh, RF integrated circuits to do the power conversion um, despite uh, running at slightly higher frequencies than uh, I would argue was, was previously sort of accepted space for uh, CMOS low voltage electronics. Um, and that's made possible by the, the, um, the RF group on the project that we work with. Um, I think it's made a lot of progress in this area. So CMOS is great because you can make basically anything in it. You can throw in a processor core or any other type of complex circuitry. Um, it simply suffers traditionally inefficiency versus higher performance semiconductors like gallium nitride. Um, but this turns out to be one of the things that, that drives the mass in this design low 
is that the whole system can operate at very low voltage. There's no power converters uh, to go between voltages of solar cells and voltages of the electronics. So this was uh, published fairly recently by the RF group showing how they've stacked four power amplifiers um, in CMOS and come up with a scheme where, whereby they uh, share the su supply voltage basically. Um, and this lets the uh, stack of four power amplifiers run directly from 3.2 volts, which is uh, the approximate operating voltage of a four junction IMM solar cell that would be used in, in a particular design of the satellite that this is optimized for. So um, the, the results in that paper, um, this was actually implemented in 65 nanometer CMOS. I apologize to those of you yesterday. I was saying uh, it was a, a less precise uh, technology node. It is 65 nanometer CMOS. Uh, they reported 37% power added efficiency at around 10 gigahertz um, operating frequency. Um, I can't comment on the choice of frequency, but I can say that this is the frequency uh, range that is used for the subsequent demos that I'll show here today. Um, so that is a, a relatively high frequency uh, compared to most other space-based solar power topics, uh, at least that I've seen so far at the conference. Um, moving on to the PV system, which is uh, the group that I actually work in on the project. Uh, we have a goal of, of getting to really high specific power. Um, how can we do that? Um, and as was just alluded to, um, the covered glass alone uh, sort of precludes you from being able to reach these high specific powers. 3-5 um, multi-adjunction solar cells are damaged by radiation in space and um, require uh, shielding on both the top and the bottom uh, to prevent them from degrading if you're talking about, uh, especially depending on the orbit, if you're talking about multi-year lifetimes. Um, so if we look at uh, conventional covered glass and either a thick substrate or, or glass or metal as the back shielding, uh, we find that even very efficient solar cells in the 30, 30, 30 to 35 percent range um, still aren't capable of getting the specific power above one kilowatt per kilogram, 1,000 watts per gram. So if we want to do better than that, um, we, we can think of two approaches. Um, one is we can use concentration, um, which I think Im importantly also given the cost of 3-5 photovoltaics um, is a, an important uh, distinction that this makes the project uh, much more affordable, um, but still requires the use of covered glass. Um, or we can look at emerging thin film materials that, are, uh, that have greater radiation tolerance, but which are not you know, proven or, or accepted for space use at this time. And we're actually working on both. We'll start by talking about the concentrator approach first. So this would sh show sort of a cross-section of a tile. Um, and we've written a few papers about various aspects of this. But basically, um, this uses a 1D reflective concentrator um, with thin strips of high-efficiency solar cells on the back of each concentrator element. Um, it's not a new design for concentrating PV. Um, in fact, this done has, has even been explored a little bit in space um, in, in previous experiments, um, although to my knowledge, this, um, the size scale here, you see the 15 millimeter dimension is a little bit smaller than previous concentrators. So sort of approaching the, the size regime of, of more of a micro concentrator. And the reason for that is because that means the heat has less physical distance that it has to, to be spread for radiation for keeping the cell cool. So from a macroscopic viewpoint, even though we're, we're focusing light, um, by spreading the heat, um, therm thermodynamically this looks, starts to look more like a non-concentrating surface as opposed to a design where you have a gigantic mirror focusing a bunch of sunlight onto a smaller area um, where you can't spread that heat out over the same area as the incident sunlight. It does, however, require that we add material to conduct the heat to keep the cells cool enough and that we develop uh, lightweight high emissivity coatings for pretty much every surface in the whole system. So to illustrate a little bit of that, that trade-off, um, if we look at the concentration factor, um, for a certain set of assumptions, I believe this assumes a one millimeter wide solar cell in our concentrator. So by varying the concentration factor, we'd be varying the um, pitch or length of each uh, reflector. Um, and we start at low concentration. Uh, we have very large solar cells and find ourselves in the um, you know, low specific power regime of having a bunch of covered glass everywhere. If we want to go to really high concentration factors, though, and, and make the, the solar cell mass itself negligibly small, we find that um, 
we need to add so much thermal conductor material to the reflector um, that we start uh, losing that benefit of reducing the solar cell mass. So what we found um, for the size of solar cells that we're looking at for this project is that a concentration factor in the range of, of 10 to 20x uh, makes sense. So to illustrate those three regions, we have cover glass, limited, thermal limited, and then the balanced range. Um, and this can vary a little bit depending on your assumption for how big the cells are or what the range um, for the pitch can be. But for uh, the, the area that we chose to focus here, uh, we, we consistently wind up in sort of this 10 to 20x um, area. So this is a, a video, um, I apologize, I think it's going to be a little bit choppy on this display, um, showing a you know, conceptual rendering of the, uh, this tile concept um, to help illustrate uh, the composition. Um, we've developed these uh, ultralight composite reflectors made from very thin carbon fiber. Um, we apply a mirror coating to them using a, a gel smoothing technique. So po polymer front surface that's then metallized with silver. Um, it's integrated with the RF uh, integrated circuit. And then at the bottom is the uh, antenna array, which functions as a phased array for power transmission. So uh, starting uh, last year, we started uh, trying to make fully functional demonstrators of this. Um, this shows just, just the PV subsection, um, which I think is a neat picture because it's partially transparent, um, showing the, um, you can see the solar cells on the back of the reflector. This is under the solar simulator. Um, and if we look at the progression of our work, starting in 2015, actually before I joined the project, there had already been a mechanical uh, mock-up showing simply that you could make a structure of this approximate shape um, with lightweight materials. In 2016, we started trying to actually make the solar cells work on it, and then in 2017, um, we started actually connecting the solar cells together and connecting that to an RF-producing uh, circuit. So, I forgot to turn the sound off. Enjoy the music during this video. Um, again, I apologize, it's a little bit choppy, um, but this is a video in our lab from last year uh, showing an integrated tile. Um, so this is simulated AM0 sunlight at our solar simulator in the lab. We're not actually in space. Um, that's poster board to <laughs> behind us, but believe it or not. <laughs> um, but what that is, that's an authentic grad student um, simulated astronaut and I believe professor's hand showing, uh, uh, intercepting the beam. Um, so there's uh, 16 antenna elements you can see on the bottom. I, I believe in this case that actually only 12 are driven. Um, and that is a, a rectenna board with uh, some sort of maximum power point tracking circuit on it or something that's powering a white LED. And thanks to a collaborator, Tatiana from Northrop, um, who is also here today, um, fetching it, we have a instance of the tile here, which will be available whenever it makes sense. I'm not gonna pass it around, but um, if you wanna come look at it um, after, the, after this session, definitely come take a look. So, one more quick topic. Um, I said concentrators are one way to get higher specific power. Another that we're starting to look at is emerging thin film materials. Um, and the hot emerging thin film material is perovskites. This is work um, from another group, a, a group in Austria actually, uh, that came out in 2015, where they showed that perovskites can indeed have very high specific power. Um, so these are terrestrial spectrum, you know, unshielded numbers. Um, for perovskites versus other types of solar cells, uh, showing in, in this case they, they got a specific power of over 20, uh, 20 what it, 23 watts per gram, I guess, uh, with a protective overcoat that let these cells be stable for a couple weeks. Um, so it's an emerging material. There's still a lot of challenges. Um, you can't buy perovskite solar cells for your roof today um, because they're not a very stable material system. Um, but what intrigued us was the high specific power and the fact that what they're most sensitive to is water, primarily, and there's not water in space. So we wondered, uh, well, how do they do with respect to radiation? 
So um, we made some perovskite cells in our lab, and these IV curves show the uh, behavior of the cell before and after proton irradiation, which are measurements that we did in collaboration with the Aerospace Corporation, uh, not far from here. And sure enough, after irradiation, the efficiency was dramatically reduced. Um, but what's really interesting, and unlike other PV materials, is the fact that the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current was not changed, suggesting that the underlying material and its radiative efficiency had not been degraded. And we found, sure enough, that after annealing these in vacuum, in simulated space, um, that the performance was essentially recovered. We've done some initial testing on these and found that they're actually quite resistant to both electron and proton radiation that damages conventional 3-5 solar cells, which is very exciting. But I do also want to, to point out that these are cells that are not long-term stable uh, under operating temperature um, and under UV light. So it, in no way is this, you know, something that um, where we want to start talking about TRL. <laughs> Um, but it's very exciting, and it's an area that we're working on now, um, and is uh, the, obviously the thin film flat plate collection geometry uh, is more amenable to a lot of the other types of space-based solar concepts that are being discussed as well. So to summarize, uh, we've put a lot of effort into developing technologies for free-flying spacecraft. Um, we're, we're really targeting high specific power. Um, there's been some fantastic work on the, the RF integrated circuits um, and starting to really look at emerging really ultralight materials. There are trade-offs um, or, or certainly things that you could criticize for this approach uh, versus some other approaches having to do with the capacity factor, for example, due to it being a flat plate um, system without separately articulating RF and PV um, apertures. Um, so of course we're looking into bifacial systems that can receive or transmit uh, sunlight or RF, well, as that makes sense from either side. Um, the system is potentially compatible with uh, articulating reflectors as are common in other proposals. Um, the cost is something that is being taken into account and is certainly favors uh, using thin film materials. And then of course the, the choice of frequency, um, I think, I'm, I'm not convinced, is, is almost a question of um, regulatory issues more than technology ones at this point. And I don't want to talk too much about this, but I'll, I'll point out that there are three research groups at, at Caltech working on this. These are the PIs. Um, I work in the Atwood group on the photovoltaic side. Um, so if you're looking for the papers to, um, to download, I would recommend going to, these, the, to the websites for these three PIs. And also mention that, that a lot of the work is supported and done in collaboration with Northrop that's presented here. So. I definitely want to acknowledge the, the tremendous support we've gotten from our, our collaborators um, and funding sources on this one. Um, it's a great project going on on campus, um, and I'm very pleased to be part of it. So with that, thank you. All right, our next speaker, who I don't see, is Koji Tanaka. Oh, there he is. All right, right, right in the middle. All right, good. Uh, Koji Tanaka is a researcher at JAXA and has been working in solar power satellites for many years. He has, this is not his first uh, SPS uh, symposium. Come on up. So and he is going to give us an overview of 